Good morning. Good morning. Um, I'm a graduate of Knox, Westminster, and I've been at this church as long as I can remember. And i um, actually been on staff for 19 years. Uh, my title is Director of Ministry. I don't know what that means. It kind of sounds like something from the UN. Um, when I decided that I was going to go to Knox, I remember talking to Sam back there. He was one of his first classes, maybe one of maybe the first class, and he was the director of students or dean of students or some title, and he was interviewing me or guiding me. I don't know which it was, but it was something. And as we were talking, I asked him about seminary because I felt ill-equipped to go to seminary. I felt ill-equipped on many different reasons. I didn't feel like I could keep up with the, you know, the ability of all the other guys that I knew, knew, and some of my friends were extremely smart, and so I was very intimidated, and I went to him and I asked him, should I do this? And he basically said, it's not the smart guys to win, it's the most persistent. And I thought, I got a chance. Well, it took me seven and a half years to finish. So you can say one thing I am is persistent, um, at least to get my Knox education. And then I talked to Warren Gage, and it was right in that hallway over here, and I'd said, you know, I went to school for engineering, and he looked at me and he said, we don't need more engineers, we need more poets. So both the guys basically, one thought I was dumb but persistent, the other thought, here, here I am, this guy that is an engineer and doesn't understand poetry, but both were true. I didn't understand either. I realized I was ill-equipped and God was faithful, but I also realized that there is a poetic message to what we do. And how does it come together in our lives? And so I'm gonna tell you three stories that have been really important to me. One is, in the title of this message, or devotional is, Live Like You're Dying. If you're familiar with the country song by Tim McGraw, um, the backdrop of the story is much more captivating than even the lyrics of the story, which I think are great. Tim McGraw is the son of Tug McGraw. And if you're familiar, Tug McGraw was a pitcher in 1980 and won the World Series. Um, but Tim did not know he was the son of Tug McGraw until he was 17 years old. And it was actually Tug McGraw denied that he was the father of Tim for all those years. And when he was 17, it came out and it was very clear that he was his son. And a few years later, Tim McGraw got a brain tumor. And when he got a brain tumor, his whole life changed. He began to think about his life differently. It says on March 12, 2003, McGraw was working as an instructor for the Philadelphia Phillies. Um, when the surgery, they had gone in and found a brain tumor. When the surgery happened, they thought they had gotten everything. Well, they didn't. And nine months later, he died. And during those nine months, he went before the fans in Philadelphia because he's a hero. He won the World Series. There's a pose of him in 1980 holding up his hands as he was the pitcher at the time. But he goes out and he thinks that he's going to live forever. And at the end of the day, he doesn't beat cancer. Cancer gets him. And so Tim McGraw, his son, writes a song called Live Like You're Dying. And this song to me is incredibly powerful. And let me just read some of the lyrics to you as this is a story that I've thought about since I was actually working with youth in high school. And it says this, he said when I was in my early 40s with a lot of life before me, when a moment came that stopped me on a dime, and I spent most of the next days looking at x-rays and talking about the options, talking about sweet time, and I asked him when I sank in that this might be the, really, the real end, how it hits you when you get that kind of news. Man, what would you do? I went skydiving, I went Rocky Mountain climbing, I went 2.7 seconds on a bull named Fu Manchu, and I loved deeper, and I smoked, spoke sweeter. And I gave forgiveness I'd been denying. And he said someday when you get a chance to live like you're dying. Powerful. You see this Tug McGraw probably had great regrets and shame. And he looks at his son, and his son writes a story about his life and the very fact that he said he started going fishing with him, he started thinking about what was important. He says, I even look up in the sky and I look at an eagle flying by. The reality is he stopped for a second and said, what is life about? But it wasn't until he realized he was dying that he could even think about it. If you have your Bibles, I would love you to turn with another story. This is in the book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah 1. I'm just going to read a few verses. Nehemiah 1.4. 
and says, as soon as I heard these words, what these words were about is the fact that the walls of Jerusalem were broken down and he's looking and the temple's destroyed, the walls are burnt down. And as soon as he hears these words, this is what happens. I sat down and wept and mourned for days and I continued fasting and praying before God of heaven. And I said, O God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant and his steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant that I now pray before you day and night for the people of Israel are your servants. Confessing the sins of people of Israel which have sinned against you, even, and this is the part, even I and my father house have sinned. The last thing I'm going to, the story that I'm going to give you was when I was in high school, I was one of the youth that probably people didn't enjoy being on the youth trips with them. But have you ever seen a winger? If you've ever seen a winger, those are basically balloon launchers that can shoot 100 miles, right? They can just shoot, literally, they can shoot about a football field. You pull it back, two guys hold it like this, and then one guy pulls it and shoots this, you know, the balloons out, and they are used for good causes, I'm sure. But on this, we shoot this balloon out, and we're on a youth retreat, and one of my friends, Matt, he comes with us. He stores this winger. We're ready to go. We got our balloons out. And there's a lake with all the kids on the lake. And as these students are all in the lake, we're thinking, this is a great chance to get them. So we said, this is perfect. They're all in one spot. So we take that winger and we shoot it. We shoot it on a line drive and it goes about that far over their head, but it was so close and going so fast, everybody could hear it whistle, you know? And you could see all their attention turned to us. And they turn to us and they watch us shoot the second balloon. And it's this one, we've, we've adjusted it just perfect. And you can see the balloon going. Well, everybody jumps off of the raft because they see it, except one girl. And it's a girl that was handicapped mentally at some level. And I'm looking and realizing this is going to hit this girl. And you, that feeling when the balloon's going and you're going, can I pull it back? <laughs> and you're watching and it hits her on the side of the head. Oh my God. And I mean, at that moment, I felt like I was dying. I mean, I hit this and I go, I feel so much shame, awful. The girl collapses like we killed her. I mean, it was going 50 miles an hour, this balloon. <laughs> She lays down on the raft, just moaning. And so we're swimming to it. And I'm thinking, I've got this like two minute swim to the raft. And I'm going, I cannot believe what a horrible person I am. <laughs> I mean, how could I have done this? When we get to the raft, she's still crying. And she's got this big welt on the side of her face. And obviously the youth leaders are like, who did this? And where can you go, man? You can't hide. I said, I'm that guy. I'm so sorry, I am that guy. And she was there, she saw who it was, and at that moment you go, Lord, could I take that back? Can I have a take back? And I didn't have a take back. What I did happened. Well, fast forward 10 years. I'm at a, we do something called the No Strings Attached Banquet, and where we actually serve the homeless of our community, we serve about 400 meals. She's there as a homeless person. And I see her, and she walks up to me. And I'm like, oh my goodness, I hope to, I still have the lingering shame of what I've done. And so then, I, by guilt, I start saying, how can I help you? And so then we helped her, and now, by this church's help, she has a house, she's taken care of, and whatever. Literally, a couple months later, she comes up to me, and she sees me in the hall, and she says to me, I want to tell you something. And I'm feeling like, okay, this is that moment where we're going to get it out on the table. She said, I wanted to tell you, you've always been nice to me, and I wanted to thank you. And I go, how unworthy am I? That moment where your heart comes out of your chest, it beats, it's exposed, and you look and you say, I didn't deserve none of that. I tell you this because I live in a world of ministry where there's a lot of things you regret. There's a lot of things you guys will do, and it seems easy when you start, but I can tell you it's not easy. My feeling more than not is like Nehemiah where I see the walls burnt down and I go, Lord, I weep and I mourn. But what I love in the story of 
Nehemiah goes and says, I confess. I confess. But at the end of confession, at the end of the confession, the realizing we are broken is where pardon is understood. It is when a young lady doesn't remember what you did as far as the east is from the west and forgiveness is received. And now the realization that I am dying and that I'm, all those things are reality and I'm living like I'm dying, what's great is to see the light of the good news of the gospel. These little pictures are stories we're all gonna have in our lives. But I tell you and I encourage you this, I've been a minister for probably 24 years working in church. I've always had the belief that I was gonna fix everything. The older I get, the more I realize, probably not. But I can tell you there's a sweet spot in the very fact that you look at burnt walls that are broken down and God drives you to confession. And when you go to confession, he says, you are pardoned and you are forgiven. And there's little stories in life that give us and remind us of that. And I encourage you all that are going into ministry, be quick, be quick to confess your own sin. Because that's where you see the gospel most rich and alive. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we lift you up. We confess our sins because you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins. We thank you for the righteousness you give to us that's undeserved. You take our place. Lord, we thank you that you are a God that takes our sins from the east as far as to the west. Help this group be a group of people that confesses quickly and often, but also comes to you and realize there's great news that you took care of it all for us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.